Okay, so we are 10 minutes past the hour. I uh, want to make an apology to everyone watching this recording. Uh, we did have to shift the time up a little bit just because of some urgent things that came up. Uh, however, we will be back to our normal scheduled 6 p.m. West African time um, next week. So uh, today, speaking on AV blocks and sinus talks, we have Dr. Ijoma Kiro from uh, the University of Texas. She's an associate professor in cardiac electrophysiology, and she is going to be kicking off our week two talk. If you want to take it from here. Okay, so I've muted. Yes, yes, I am. All right, yep, fantastic. Thank you. So, um, like AJ said, um, I'm Ijama Akero. I'm one of the um, cardiac electrophysiologists at UT Health in Houston, Texas, as well as being part of the Cardiovascular Education Foundation. I'm part of the EP group with that. Um, and I've been involved in um, education for the CVEF um, since a little bit after its infancy. So I'm really excited to be here again. Um, so um, thank you guys for coming. We'll be talking today about um, AV blocks and sinus talks, basically talking about um, sinus, um, the sinus node, sinus function, and why do we talk about putting in pacemakers and what is the normal function um, of the sinus node and AV node, what would you expect to see with um, abnormalities there? And so, um, you know, and this will kind of build up a little bit on Dr. Patazic's talk last week. Um, there might be some slides that you've seen before, so um, don't hold that against me. It was deliberate, and we'll just kind of be going over a little bit of what um, was discussed last week. So um, I want to start off with a few questions. Um, you know, you don't have to answer them right now. We'll go over them again at the end. Um, but basically, um, I want you to kind of have an idea of why the concepts that we're going to be talking about today um, will be important in your clinical practice. So let's start off with question one. Um, a 75-year-old man with a history of hypertension who presents for his annual follow-up. He's feeling well without any complaints, but he's found to be bradycardic with an irregular rhythm on examination, and his EKG is shown, um, is going to be on the next screen. A Holtermann monitor confirms this and shows multiple episodes similar to his EKG with heart rates in the 30s during sleep. An echocardiogram is unremarkable and his heart rate increases appropriately with exercise. And so this is what the EKG looks like. I want you to take kind of a picture in your brain of what it looks like. Um, and then um, basically the question is, what's the next best step in managing this patient? A, would you put in a pacemaker? Um, especially with that heart rate that gets down to the 30s. B, would you do some imaging, try to figure out exactly what's going on? C, continued observation. D, a cardiac um, PET scan. Or E, an implantable loop recorder. And that's basically a monitor that we put underneath the skin to monitor the heart rhythm to determine if we're going to do anything else. So that's your question one. Question two, we have an asymptomatic 72-year-old man who's referred to the emergency department by his ophthalmologist because he was found to be bradycardic on routine examination. And in the emergency room, an EKG reveals sinus rhythm with two to one AV block. Which finding would be consistent with an infranodal AV block? And so there are two things that we're going to be kind of talking about here. You'll be able to answer this question after the talk. Number one, you know, what kinds of AV blocks are significant? Number two, what do you exactly mean by infranodal AV block? And so we'll talk about that. But A, theophylin would improve AV conduction. B, atropine, improving AV conduction. C, leg exercises, improving AV conduction. D, valsalva maneuver, worsening AV conduction. And E, carotid sinus massage, improving AV conduction. And then the third question, we have a 76-year-old woman, all these people in their 70s having problems, 76-year-old woman with a history of two prior ablation procedures for AFib, presenting with recurrent symptomatic paroxysmal AFib, refractory to flecainide and diltiazem therapy. EKG shows 
atrial fibrillation with ventricular rates in the 160s to 180s, and an echo shows normal LV systolic function with diastolic dysfunction and left atrial dimension of 5.5 centimeters. She converts to sinus rhythm spontaneously after initiation of sodalol, 120 milligrams BID load. After three doses, she has sinus bradycardia with a ventricular rate of 40 beats a minute. She notes increased fatigue in sinus rhythm. What is the next best step in manage management? A, a dual chamber pacemaker. B, a leadless ventricular pacemaker. C, switch to amiodarone. D, switch to propafenone. And E, a pacemaker and AV node ablation. So those are three questions I want you to kind of consider. We'll come back to these at the end. Um, but basically the objectives here, we're going to be talking a little bit about the conduction system. We'll talk about um, different levels of heart block and then we'll also kind of touch into the management of bradycardia. So we talked about this last week about what the conduction system entails and what it looks like. Basically, you know, you have your sinus node, you have your interatrial conduction system that allows you to have those fast um, conduction to the right and the left um, atrium, and it all coalesces into the atrioventricular node um, from which it goes through the bundle of His and down the Purkinje fibers into the ventricles. And so, you know, this constitutes the backbone of the conduction system of the heart that is innovated by um, your um, autonomic um, function, so you could, um, by the vagus nerves, as well as um, by um, your sympathetic um, innervation as well. Um, so when you have, um, you know, a normal sinus rhythm, you expect your heart rate to be between 60 and 100 beats a minute. Um, your AV conduction, if let's say the sinus node gets knocked out and your AV node has to pick up, then number one, you'll see that you'll have a junctional rhythm, so you won't see that atrial contraction, um, and your heart rate will be expected to be between 40 and 60 beats a minute. So that junction has is a backup pacemaker to the sinus node, um, and you'd expect that to be between 40 and 60 beats a minute. Um, and the reason why it's slower than the sinus node is so that it doesn't overtake the sinus node at any point. And then the ventricle is also capable of being a cardiac pacemaker, but by the time you get to the ventricle, it's not really a reliable partner. And so once we get to a ventricular escape rhythm, that at that point, we're really worried that, you know, we need to work um, really um, fast. And so, um, but the ventricular rhythm usually sits at less than 40 beats a minute. And um, it's usually a wide complex if you see that then um, we need to start working on putting in a pacemaker. So um, going back to the EKG and what the EKG looks like, um, as we made mention, your PR interval um, is, or your P wave basically talks about what is happening in the atrium and your atrial depolarization. Your P wave typically lasts about less than 80 milliseconds, and that's how long you expect for your activation to go through that conduction system and also for the atrium to contract. And basically the P wave is um, what you see that um, signifies atrial depolarization. The PR interval is the time from the sinus node for the, your impulse to get from the sinus node to the AV node. And that typically should last about 200 milliseconds. Usually with that PR segment, you'd expect it to be about 120 to 200 milliseconds. If it's less than that, then you're worried that you might have some ventricular pre-excitation, maybe the presence of a bypass tract that you can see in WPW. Um, um, but if it's longer than that, then you expect there to be some de um, delay either in the atrium or in the AV node. Um, followed by that, you have your QRS, which signifies um, depolarization of the ventricles. It by itself is about 80 to 100 milliseconds, maybe 120 milliseconds if you have some intervent um, interventricular conduction delay. Um, and then, of course, your ST segment shows you the depolarization of the ventricles, and your T um, wave is your repolarization of the ventricles, um, such that your QT interval um, typically just um, tells us what's happening in the ventricle, both depolarization and repolarization. Usually, it's corrected to about 440 to 460 milliseconds. If it's greater than that, then we're a little bit concerned. 
Um, and then your U wave um, is supposed to be depolarization of the interventricular septum. Typically, we don't see it. However, sometimes you do see it. Um, it can be a normal variant. Um, sometimes when you have electrolyte abnormalities, you can actually see that a little bit more. Um, but um, it's something that we don't really pay close attention to without other things that would make us a little bit more concerned. Now, we have the EKG that basically tells us what's happening, you know, from the chest. It's a non-invasive test, and it can tell us what's happening in the AV node. If we want to do a deeper dive, then the EP study is the way to go. And this is basically the gold standard for determining um, arrhythmic causes of syncope, um, including the most um, common, the sinus node, um, sinus node dysfunction, um, his Purkinje block, and also tachyarrhythmias. We're going to be... Um, talking about the causes of bradycardia. Um, and so I just wanted to give you an example of what an EP study should look like. Um, previously, people who were smarter than me would um, actually take um, a catheter and put it on the epicardial surface of the heart. And that's where they were able to get information about what's happening in the sinus node. Um, in the um, modern iteration of the EP study, you actually don't see what's happening in the sinus node. That is determined by what happens on your EKG. So if you see a P wave, then you're like, okay, this is where the sinus node should have started. Um, and then we're able to see exactly what is happening on the inside of the heart. So after um, your depolarization or your signal comes from the sinus node into the atrium, then we're able to determine all of that. Um, the reason why that becomes important is that it's able to tell us, hey, this is what's happening um, in the atrium when it goes through the heart, as well as when um, what's happening in the ventricle. Um, we're able to see exactly how the conduction is happening through the heart. So when we put in our catheters, we put in four catheters typically for an EP study, one in the high right atrium, one in the coronary sinus, one in the his area, uh, one in the right ventricular apex or the outflow tract. Um, basically, we're looking at, um, you know, what's happening in the atrium, and this is going to be determined by what happens in the high right atrial catheter, as well as the CS catheter. Um, your high right atrial catheter will tell you what's happening in the atrium. Your right ventricular apical catheter will tell you what's happening in the ventricle. What's happening in the CS basically tells you what's happening in the atrium and the ventricle. And it's um, basically relegated to what's happening in the left atrium. So you're able to tell how conduction is going from the high right atrium, which is where closest to the sinus node, um, to the ventricle. And then this his catheter becomes really important because it tells you what's happening in the his and happening in the AV node. So you have your AH interval and your HV interval. Your AH interval tells you what's happening in the AV node. Your HV interval tells you what's happening in the his Purkinje system. Um, your AH interval usually is a little bit longer, about 50 to um, you know 100 milliseconds. Your HV interval is about 30 to 55 milliseconds typically really short, um, the combination of the two give us a rough estimate of what your PR interval should look like. And then um, this is just some kind of views um, to let you know what's supposed to happen um, or what your um, catheters are supposed to look like um, when you go into x-ray. This is your RAO view, that's your LAO view, and you can tell your catheters on the right except for your CS catheter that goes to the left side. So let's get started. So your left, um, when we're talking about block, we should talk about two things. Number one, um, let's talk about levels of block. Everybody knows, you know, when we're talking about first degree block, second degree block, third degree block. You know, the second degree block seems to be a little bit um, more um, difficult to kind of um, recognize or um, a little bit more difficult to explain. Um, first degree um, block typically talks about prolonged conduction. So whether we're talking about, you know, um, in the sinoatrial block, which I'll explain to you later, or the atrioventricular node, basically what ends up happening is that there is a delay in conduction. So it's not really a block per se, it's just basically a delay, right? Third degree basically means that there is no conduction between the higher level um, um the higher level area and the lower level area. So if you're talking about the sinoatrial area, you're talking between the sinus node and the atrium. If you're talking about the atrioventricular area, you're talking between the atrium and the ventricle. Basically, those two areas just have no um, 
communication with each other. And so typically what happens in the lower end, you have an escape rhythm that kind of kicks in. So, um, you know, and second degree basically means that you have intermittent conduction. Type one will tell you that there's progressive prolongation between the higher um, level and the lower level. And type two means this sudden failure. So all of a sudden, you know, you're conducting and then all of a sudden there's nothing there. Now, um, there are different locations of block, right? So AV block, we talk about it all the time. It's very easy to see because you see a P wave and then you see you see a QRS or you don't see a QRS. Um, the H AV node, um, when you're talking about block, you can actually have it be in the AV node and that's considered to be suprahissian or above the level of the hiss. It can be at the level of the hiss, which is intrahissian, or it can be below the level of the hiss, which is infrahissian. And that you can only define by doing an EP study. On the EKG, it kind of looks the same. But the um, reasons this is really important in determining if the patient will need a pacemaker or if you want to wait a little bit longer, because if it's super hissian or in the AV node, then there's a possibility that there's something systemic that's causing that block um, and it can be reversible. If it's intrahissian or infrahissian, it's less likely to be reversible and it's more important for you to rush through that and um, put in a pacemaker. The sinoatrial block, basically what we're talking about is conduction between the sinus node, which sits at the, um, the epicardial portion of the heart, and the rest of the conduction system, basically the atrium, right? And so all of those um, types of block, you know, the first degree, second degree, and third degree can happen between the sinus node and the atrium the same way that it happens between the AV node, um, um, between the atrium and the ventricle, with the AV node being the location of the block. And so um, I do want to, um, you know, kind of touch on this a little bit more, because this is a type of block that we typically don't really recognize. And then we also don't recognize how important it is uh, for us to um, place a pacemaker if it's needed. And sometimes the EKG can give us an idea that, hey, there is something here going on that we need to address um, a little bit more than not, or a little bit quicker than we typically do. So when we talk about sinus node dysfunction, what we have to understand is that the sinus node um, consists of pacemaker cells, which we call P cells, and then the perinodal cells or the transitional cells, which we call the T cells. And the P cells basically are where um, you generate the impulse, right? That sinus node and Dr. Potasic talked about, you know, the action potential that basically, you know, self regenerates or self depolarizes um, for you to continue having your um, sinus beat. Um, that originates in the sinus node itself. The transitional cells basically transmit the electrical impulse from the sinus node to the right atrium. And so the transitional cells are not able to generate that recurrent beat. Um, the sinus node, the pacemaker cells are the ones that do that. And when you have um, sinus node dysfunction, um, you could have a sinus node arrest, which basically means that there's a problem in impulse generation, or you could have a sinus node eight, um, exit block where you have problems in transmission from the sinus node pacemaker cells to the right atrium. And typically that's because there is some sort of dysfunction in the transitional cells um, that go through um, the atrium. So um, as this diagram shows you, like you'll have the um, pacemaker cells and then you'll have the transitional cells and then you have the, you know, the atrium, right? And so if you have your impulse being generated here and there is some sort of dysfunction in the transitional cells, then there's going to be a problem getting that impulse from the pacemaker cells to the rest of the atrium. And that will affect where your P wave um, actually appears on um, your EKG. So in talking about disorders of the sinus node, the first one we'll talk about is sinus arrest. Um, basically is also um, referred to as a sinus pause and there is a failure of the sinus node to generate an impulse. So basically the sinus node is not working. And again, you might ask me, well, how do you know that this is the case? Well, like I mentioned, there are people who are much smarter than me before the times, you know, before now, 
who basically put in that catheter that is able to determine, um, basically acts like an EKG on the um, inside of the heart. Um, they put the catheter where the sinus node was, and they were able to define these different kinds of blobs. And so when you have a failure of the sinus node to generate an impulse, basically you will not have, you know, a P wave. So sometimes um, you can see that the way that you can recognize it is that the PP interval, so the um, interval between the P waves is not going to be a multiple of the preceding P wave interval. It's not, um, and I'll, I'll also talk to you about another time when we see that. Um, if it's greater than three seconds, it's considered to be abnormal. So um, what you might see is something that looks like this, where the P wave is just kind of marching along and then um, P waves are marching along and then all of a sudden you don't see any P waves. So that's basically what you should be looking for is that it's not an AV block because if it was an AV block, you'd see a P wave, no QRS. Here you actually don't see any of the P waves. And so that's basically what becomes important. So for sinoatrial block, also known as sort of sino or auricular block sometimes, um, the sinus node function is normal, but transmission to the rest of the atrium is blocked. So there's a problem with those transitional cells. There's different types. The same way that you have it with AV block, you have um, sinoatrial block. So your first degree, second degree, and third degree, you can have that in sinoatrial block, as well as um, having that in atrioventricular block. The first degree sinoatrial block, it really doesn't show up, right, in your EKG. Because remember, the P wave only tells you what's happening in the atrium. So whenever it is that the atrium gets that um, first impulse, that's basically when it is. So you're not going to see it on the EKG. So this is not, it's not a theory because, again, somebody much smarter than me put catheters up into the heart so they're able to define it. But for us, for all intents and purposes, we're not going to see it on the EKG. So we're not even aware that this is going on. But basically what's happening is that there's a delay in conduction from the sinus node impulse, um, from the sinus impulse, um, from the node to the atrium. So this is normal sinoatrial um, conduction where you have this denotes the impulse um, from the sinoatrial node. So you have your sinoatrial node impulse and then it basically goes into the atrium. So immediately you see your P wave immediately following. When you have a first degree sinoatrial block, there's a little bit of a delay. Again, on your EKG, you don't see it, but if you were to put a catheter up into the sinus node, you'd be able to see that there. Now, second degree is able to be seen. Why? Because you see a difference in the way or in the relationship between the PP intervals. So for type one, you have a progressive delay in the sinus impulse. So basically where you have your sinus impulse transitioning, going through the transitional cells, to um, the atrium, there's a progressive delay there. And what um, this causes is a progressive decrease in the PP interval, and then you'll see a pause. And then the pause will have a duration that's less than two PP intervals. So that's number one. And then the second thing, the interval, the PP interval after the pause is going to be greater than the PP interval before the pause. So I'll give you an example in this EKG, right? where you have these P waves. So you have these P waves that are kind of marching out and you can see the P waves are getting closer and closer and closer together. And then all of a sudden you see a pause and then it starts again and it starts getting closer and closer and closer together. So there's sometimes you might see it and you'll be like, huh, maybe this is sinoatrial, um, this is sinus arrhythmia, right? Well, yeah, I guess it could be. But then the problem is when somebody comes in, it's like, oh, I, they have this EKG, but then they're complaining about sometimes having syncope. Sometimes they have pauses that are greater than three seconds, right? If that were a sinus arrhythmia, that should not happen. This is a ladder diagram that basically tells us what we're actually seeing. So if, for instance, this is the sinus node, right? And the sinus node is coming on time. And then basically this ladder diagram here or this area here talks about what's happening in the transitional cells. So basically here, your sinus node impulse is generated, going through the transitional cells, there's a little bit of a delay, a little bit of a delay, and then there's block. But what ends up happening is once it gets into the atrium, it conducts the way it normally would conduct. But what ends up happening is that because that delay is going on, you have these 
PP interval is getting shorter and shorter until it blocks off and then it starts all over again. So if you see your sinus node um, or P waves getting closer and closer together, and then all of a sudden you don't see a P wave, and then you see it starting over again, then you should suspect a sinoatrial block. Most um, consistently, a sinoatrial um, exit block type two, um, second degree sinoatrial exit block type one. Okay. Sinoatrial block, a second degree type two, um, it's similar to what we see in type two and AB blocks. Basically, the pause is going to be a multiple of the PP interval. There's no change in the preceding PP interval. And all of a sudden, you just kind of see blocks happening, right? So for instance, here, you have your PP interval. You'd expect to see something here. This is a junctional escape. But then you see the P wave coming in where it's supposed to. And then again, um, there's a drop, right? There's no change in, you know, your PP intervals here, but then also this between the P wave and that P wave is a multiple of the PP interval that happens beforehand. Um, this again is basically what it looks like where you have intermittent failure of the sinus node impulse to transmit into the atrium. Here you have one PP interval, there you have a blocked impulse, um, this equals two PP intervals before it gets restarted. Sometimes it can be up to three or four, like a multiple of PP intervals that get blocked. Um, but this is, you know, when you see this and you see the sudden block where you don't see a P wave, then you should be concerned that there's a second degree type two sinoatrial block, in which case, you know, if this patient comes in with symptoms, you know, this is typically not something that's, um, you know, as a result of adrenergic tone or lack thereof. And this is something that you should be putting in a pacemaker for. Now for third degree sinoatrial blocks, this is complete failure of the sinus node impulses to exit the sinus node. Um, it's indistinguishable from um, sinus arrest. And so basically all you'll see is no P waves. Maybe you'll see a junctional escape rhythm. Um, but typically you don't in that um, epicardial space to determine what's happening in the sinus node. At the end of the day, you know, what's going to end up happening is, you know, the same thing. You'll see a sinus pause um, and basically you'll need to put in a pacemaker. What will happen on your EKG? You'll see a junctional escape rhythm. Um, you might see um, some pauses, you might um, not. Um, but if you see a junctional escape rhythm, because we don't exactly know what's happening with that sinus node, we typically would recommend that you put in a pacemaker at this point. So I know sinoatrial blocks are a little bit complicated. Um, does anybody have any questions? And the chat is open. If you have questions, feel free to chime in as well. Okay. Uh, one thing, so I guess I'd never done a deep dive on sinoatrial blocks before. So it, it very much correlates to what you're going to talk about next, I guess, with AV blocks, where mm -hmm. you have a type one, which is kind of like a winky block with the transition area tissue, allowing like a delayed transmission. You have a type two exactly. that is almost like a two to one or a drop, but you don't actually have yeah. a delay. And then exactly. third. Interesting. Exactly. So basically what's happening, you know, when you look at atrioventricular blocks, Typically, what we'll tell you is like the different ways to define it. If you're talking about second degree, um, you know, you can either look at what's happening in the PR interval or you can look at what's happening in the RR interval, right? But sinoatrial block, you don't have the equivalent of a PR interval because we don't have a catheter in the sinus node all the time, right? Um, so all you can tell is what's happening with the P waves. And that's basically what will determine exactly what's happening um, with your sinoatrial block. So I'm going to go to the AV um, node. Um, Dr. Patazic did a great job in explaining, you know, what happens um, with the AV node, the anatomy of the AV node, and how you should, um, you know, or where you should be expecting to see it, and also the, um, you know, associated structures, the problems with associated structures that can result in problems with the AV node, particularly if you see, you know, 
for patients now that we do a lot of, you know, TAVRs um, or for those patients, people that you refer for um, calcific um, AV, um, AV or sorry, aortic valve um, disease, um, it's not unusual for you to see that same fibrosis or that same um, calcification actually impacting the AV node just because of where it sits. And it sits at the head of the um, this um, triangle. Um, basically, we're looking at um, this triangle that is formed, it's called that like Koch's triangle, um, which is um, formed by the tendon of Todoro, the um, CS os, which is, starts at the um, inferior border, and then also the tricuspid valve, um, which is anterior. So once you um, lay that out, at the head of that is your compact AV node. Typically, what you'd expect to see is, um, you know, on your EKG, a PR interval, that's 120 to um, 200 milliseconds. Um, on the intracardiac, you measure this AV conduction using your His catheter um, with your AH interval, um, representing the conduction time from the atrium through the AV node, and then your HV interval representing conduction through um, the his Purkinje system. Your age interval usually sits between 55, 60, and 125 milliseconds, and your HV interval between 30 and 55 milliseconds. So um, this is typically what you see in your his catheter. Um, this is what, you know, if you have your atrial catheter, just kind of walking through your ventricular catheter corresponding to um, your QRS. For um, the His catheter, you should see both the atrium and the ventricle, as well as the His um, deflection there. And um, your AH interval plus your HV interval is roughly a little bit less than the PR interval on the surface EKG. Um, for first degree AV block, um, it could be as a result of different things. Um, a lot of times, like I mentioned, you know, when we talk about your locations of block, for um, your AV node, um, you're talking about superhisian, which is in the AV node, intrahisian, which is within the his Purkinje system, and infrahisian, which is below the his Purkinje system. Um, if you have it in your AV node, your H interval is prolonged. If you have it within the his Purkinje system, then you actually have two hisses, and you'll see kind of a delay in those. The presence of two hisses is not normal. So when you see that, that's automatically um, an intrahissian block. And then if you see, if you don't see that, but you see a prolongation in your HV interval, then that will tell you that, hey, there's something going on infrahissian. So for us, when things are happening in the AV node, that could be as a result of many different things. It could be as a result of, you know, sympathetic or parasympathetic tone. It could be as a result of hormones. Basically, because that has more adrenergic, um, you know, um, activators, we're not as worried about it as we do get when we see something infrahissian. Infrahiss and intrahiss, those are all non-events. So basically, if anything gets to the hiss, if it gets to any impulse, gets to the H, or to whether it's generated by itself, or it comes from the sinus node, it should pass on to the ventricle. So there isn't a delay there. So anytime we see any kind of delay and then a patient comes in with symptoms, that's a little bit more worrisome. So how do we test for this? Well, your EP study is a great place to do that. For your AV block, you note um, a prolonged PR interval, typically that's greater than 200 milliseconds. Now there's sometimes that you don't necessarily see that and that's where it becomes a little bit technical. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that as we go on. Your AV, um, your prime, uh, first degree AV block could be secondary to conduction delay at any level, like I mentioned, um, your AV node. So that will give you a prolonged AH interval. Your intra hiss, that will give you a fractionated hiss in a hiss signal. Infra hiss will give you a prolonged HV interval. So for instance, here, your um, first degree AV block that's super hissian, you know, remember I told you that you would expect this to be about 100 or 60 to 120 milliseconds. You have an AH interval here that's 250 milliseconds. So that's clearly within the node. Your AH interval is prolonged. 
Um, and so it's, and it's usually the most common cause of first degree AV block. And this is particularly the reason why most of the time, if we see a first degree AV block, we just watch it. Unless the patient is symptomatic, we don't necessarily put in a pacemaker. Um, so here you have a PR interval that's um, greater than um, 300, well, it's 320 milliseconds. So that's a little bit, you know, worrisome, but if the patient doesn't have symptoms, we don't really worry about it. Um, if you have an AV block that's intrahissian, so this is kind of an example here where you see a hiss that um, looks at the, it's connected to the atrial signal, and then you also have a hiss that's connected to the ventricular signal. When you have that intrahissian delay, then that basically tells you, hey, there's something going on here. The presence of that just tells you, okay, look, there is a first degree um, intrahissian block. So there shouldn't be any delay. You shouldn't see two his signals. If you do, then um, that's considered to be a delay. Um, for infrahissian block, you can have it happen with a normal PR interval or a prolonged PR interval. And that's because the HV interval is such a small part of your PR interval that even small increases can tell you that, hey, there's something wrong here. We might have to put in a pacemaker. We're seeing it a lot in patients who have um, TAVRs because, you know, initially they come in, they don't have any problems with their HIS signals. And then once you smash that calcium into the um, HIS, then all of a sudden you have um, episodes where you actually would need to put in a pacemaker. Um, here you have an HV interval that's 80 milliseconds that's prolonged. However, the PR interval is normal, it's 175 milliseconds. You can kind of suspect that there's a problem because your surface EKG shows that your QRS is Y here, right? Here, we also see the same thing. HV interval is prolonged, QRS interval is wide, um, and your HV interval is really prolonged here, it's 300 milliseconds. Your PR interval is going to be greatly prolonged because your HV interval is already prolonged. Um, for your second degree AV block, you have intermittent failure of um, conduction through the AV node. Um, sorry, might so be Dr. pathological. Sorry, yes. Dr. Akuru, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so if what happens in the patient clinic when you've got a patient who has a profound first degree block? So, mm -hmm. um, so for instance, it may be the, the, the PI interval is about 300 milliseconds uh -huh. um, and they've started to become um, maybe slightly symptomatic like breathlessness and things um, uh -huh. do, and would you consider maybe um, pacing pacing your ventricle if they've got normal LV function like so you shorten the AV delay um, instead yes. of just leaving it at that Oh, yeah, for sure. So that is one of the indications for um, placement of a pacemaker is if you have a significant PR interval that is, um, if you have a significant PR interval that is um, causing what we call pacemaker syndrome. And the yeah. reason why the patient becomes symptomatic is because, you know, the, by the time your your impulse has gone through the atrium, right? And it squeezes, it's squeezing against a closed AV valve. And so that's the reason why they're having all those symptoms. So they'll have shortness of breath, they'll have this flushing, um, and they'll just feel really tired with exercise. Um, so when we see that, yeah, you definitely want to put in um, uh, a pacemaker. Sure. And, and brilliant, that's fantastic. And does that depend on the uh, ejection fraction, the LV function at all? What What would you? No. Like? Okay. So the reason why you would put in the pacemaker is more because of what is happening with the patient. So the only indication for putting in a pacemaker in a patient who has first degree AV block is symptoms. So and even if if the patient is walking around, they have a PR interval that's five hundred milliseconds. And the patient is like, no, I feel great. Then there's really no indication to put in a pacemaker. Yeah, fantastic. Well, so but very, very quickly. So this I've come across this in a in clinic. So what if the patient is not symptomatic? Maybe they've got a sinus node disease and 
they're pacing the, the A a lot. But for a long time, they've been A pacing V sense and um and say for instance they've got arguments that they've got two hundred and two hundred and sixty or two hundred and seventy milliseconds. Um and and you're thinking, so is there a case to be made? Um like for instance, um to pace the V if um would that would that help your heart function, for instance? Because I'm thinking about echo here, um E and A, like in terms of the early the ventricular filling and active ventricular filling. Is there like would you because the the bigger the gap, the bigger the gap, the more are they gonna eventually is that gonna lead them to heart failure because of the prolonged PI interval or yeah. do we just treat the symptoms once they, once they get some they start to get symptomatic that's when we, we will consider pacing the v yes so basically i mean so previously right and you guys would know more about this previously you know we were a little bit restricted in programming av delays but now we have those variable av delays that you can go up to 400 milliseconds um in which case you know and the reason why we, we do that is because we'd want to pace the ventricle as little as we need to because there's more of a risk of um, RV pacing induced um, cardiomyopathy than not. And so we'd rather not pace the ventricle. Having said that, you know, if somebody comes in, PR interval is too, like they're pacing in the A and their PR interval is 260 milliseconds, right? Um, you know, as long as they're asymptomatic, that wouldn't be a problem. Like first degree AV block typically is well tolerated until you get to the point where the atrium is squeezing against the closed ventricle. And then that becomes a little bit of an issue. Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you, that was really good. Thank you. No, no problem. So um, like I made mention, you know, when you have second degree AV block, um, it could be pathologic or it could be normal. You could have increased vagal tone, um, you know, which would be normal. Um, if you have an atrial arrhythmia, a second degree AV block is actually expected. So that sometimes you'll see a P wave going at 150 beats a minute. And then you see this AV block and you're like, hmm, the second degree AV block. Well, the other thing that you should be thinking about is, well, why is this sinus node going at 150 beats a minute? Sometimes it could be an arrhythmia. And in that case, you know, your AV node is basically protecting your heart. The reason why that happens, because the AV node has this property called decremental conduction. And so if, you know, it has all these inserts from, you know, like I mentioned and Dr. Potasik mentioned, has all these inserts that come from the brain, basically telling it, hey, you know, I'm about to run now. So we're going to increase conduction through the AV node. AV node says, great, let's go. Or it says, oh, you know, there's a lion chasing me. I need to go. AV node says, awesome. Now, there's sometimes the atrium just goes off on its own, either because of atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. The AV node will say, well, I don't know about this. Sinus node didn't tell me anything. The brain didn't tell me anything. The hormones aren't telling me anything. I think I'm just going to stick to not doing that much. And basically it does. So the faster you pace in the atrium, the slower the ventricle, the slower the AV node will conduct. So the faster you pace, the slower the AV node will conduct, and you will have this period where you will have actually a normal AV block. So that's the reason why most of the time when we see a second degree type one, we're not really very concerned, you know, because we think it might be normal. It might be either because of increased vagal tone or it's because in that situation, the, um, the sinus node or whatever rhythm was going on in the atrium wasn't supposed to be going that fast, right? Now, that sometimes it's abnormal. If you have an inferior wall MI, you could affect blood flow to the um, AV node. Um, sometimes drugs can do it, right? So your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, they do it, in which case your um, heart rate will go down as a result. And then they can sometimes be reversed by altering your vagal tone. So if you um, increase or if you exercise, right, that increases your vagal tone. So for instance, if you see yourself being in a two to one AV block, all of a sudden you're exercising and then you notice conduction actually improves, then that tells you, okay, this is happening in the AV node. This is physiologic. This is not really something to worry about. If you see the opposite happen, then that means that there's something going on with the AV node itself and we should be a little bit concerned. 
Dr. Crow, just a um, quick question. You'd mentioned decremental properties of the AV node. In retrograde, do you still see, can you see decremental or is it always pretty consistent conduction timing? No, so with retrograde, it's pretty much the same. Okay. You can see it retrograde, you can see it aggregate. Yes. Okay, so you don't see retro, it'll be steady all the time. No, so retrograde, you actually do see decremental conduction decremental. as well. Okay. Yeah. And so that's how we define and this is more a discussion for like EP studies and such, but when we pace in the ventricle for an EP study, that's how we define what's going on in, um, if you have a bypass tract or if you, this is normal AV node conduction, one of the things that we look at is decremental conduction. So if we're pacing in the ventricle, we expect there to be some delay in VA conduction um, until it kind of goes into that two to one. Okay. Thank you. That's normal. Yeah. All okay. right. That's so, sorry, Dr. Kuro. That's fantastic. That's great. Really great presentation. That's why you've got me fired up. That's why I'm asking loads of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, really quick question. Um, uh -huh. I mean, you did ask. You did ask, ask a question at the beginning, which I caught the end of with with the AF. Um, so, I wanted to ask why you're on the AV conduction. Um, mm -hmm. What, how, so somebody with AF, um, rapidly, um, AF with rapidly conducted uh, ventricular response rate and mm -hmm. AF with slow ventricular conduction rate. So when they're mm -hmm. exercising, what parameters are at play there to differentiate, to cause, to make one go faster or one go slower? And what happens? What, what, what sort of mediators are at play? when when somebody's exercise with AF and things like that? What was dominating the AV conduction so that you get a ventricular? Well, so AV conduction in um in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter and atrial arrhythmias in general is basically it's warped. And that's the reason why you can't really kind of determine that, right? So with all exercise, you will have some effect to the AV node from the sympathetic innervation. So if somebody has atrial fibrillation and they're usually sitting at a rate of, I don't know, 80 to 90 beats a minute, once they start exercising, that's going to increase, right? But the degree at which it increases is going to be much faster. Why? Because the atrial activation, instead of it being 60 beats a minute, I don't know, 70 beats a minute, 90 beats a minute, is actually 300 to 400 beats a minute, right? So you're going to see a jump. So if somebody is at 80 to 90 at baseline, all of a sudden with minimal exertion, they're going to go up to 130 beats a minute. But that's because number one, you have your sympathetic innervation increasing your conduction, right? And then also you have this baseline electrical activation from the atrium is really fast. So, it's it's the same thing that does it in sinus node and um sorry in sinus node function I'm sorry in normal function and atrial fibrillation um it's the same mechanism for you know AV nodal conduction it's just that there is an enhanced or an increased degree of ventricular response as a result of the baseline rate. Right. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, it does. So I'm, I'm taking it. So for instance, I can use that to explain why maybe some patients might have um, AF with a slow V response rate and AF with fast V response rate purely because- Not of, really. Um, all right, sorry. So I, I was thinking maybe also um, refractory properties of, of, of the AV node is quite unique to the person as well. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that has more to do with why folks have, some people have a slow, some people have a fast. Um, yeah, atrial fibrillation, ventricular rhythms, they're not as simple, you know, as, well, we'll talk about that more. On yeah, the sorry. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. That was really uh, good. Thank you. So I do want to make mention, right, that if you see grouped beating, right, you should think to yourself second degree whether it's atrioventricular or sinoatrial. So if you see groups, you should think second degree. Think about it like this. Whenever you have first degree, 
your QRSs are going to be the same. Either because your P waves are the same or your QRSs are the same, you know, because the AV block is going to be consistent, right? If you have third degree, what you're seeing is an escape rhythm, which should also be the same. So anytime you see group beating, you should think to yourself, hey, there's some sort of second degree going on. Either it's sinoatrial or it's atrioventricular. I just need to figure out what it is, okay? So here we have an example of what group beating looks like, right? So you have see this group of four, all of a sudden there's a block, you see this group of four, then there's a block, you know. Sometimes you'll see a group of four, then a group of three, then there's a block. But basically, just looking at this EKG, I should basically say second degree. And then I will now look a little bit closer to figure out what kind of second degree is it, right? In this particular case, I know it's a second degree type one because your PR interval after the block is shorter than the PR interval before the block. And if I were to be more technical, you see the PR interval gets longer, 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 longest, and then it blocks off. But the easiest way to look at it is identify where your block is, look at the interval before the block, look at the interval after the block. And then if your PR interval after the block is shorter than your PR interval before the block, then that is a type one um, second degree AV block, otherwise known as Winky Bach. Okay. And inferior posterior MI as well. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so for, for those of you who, uh, the interventionalists, that's when you know the interventionalists, because they're like, oh my God, there's an MI need to do that. And the EPs are like, yeah, what's up, up with that block? So one doesn't necessarily need to be the other. Now, the causes of that, again, can go between intrahissian, infrahissian, all the things. And, you know, the reason for or whether or not you'll put in a pacemaker, I mean, we don't typically um, do EP studies for this again um, anymore. Um, but um, we typically use symptoms most of the time. However, it is, you know, great testable material. And so you will, you know, for those of you who will take like EP boards or anything like that, you will see things like this where they'll ask you, okay, is it infrahissian or intrahissian? And that's why we kind of, I, I wanted to spend a little bit more time here. And so in this particular case, we have an example of where you have, you know, your hiss, you know, signals here. You have your A, your H, your V. You have your A, increased AH interval, and then the V. And then you have an A, no H interval, and no V, right? So what is this? This is going to be a superhissian type one block. Why? Because the block happened at the before you got to the hiss, right? And you also see a prolongation in your AH interval. Okay. For the infrahissian, what happens is what's happening below the hiss, right? So you have your AHV. Your HV is already long. It's like 110 milliseconds here. Then you have your AHV that is increasing. It's 190 milliseconds. And then here you have your block you have an A, you also have an H, you have no V. So here it's infrahissian because it's below the level of the hiss. Now it's much less common to see this like than a type two or two to one block. But if you see the progressive prolongation of the HV interval, then you should really be concerned. And this is a patient that you'd want to put a pacemaker in, right? No matter what the PR interval is. And that's because what you have demonstrated here is that there is a disease in the HV interval or infrahissian. Dr. Carroll, your, yes. your cursor is not showing up. You Is there a way you can turn on the... Um... Oh. oh, well, there it is. Sorry, I thought you were pointing at things earlier. Never mind. I was pointing at things, but I guess it doesn't show up when I do it on my other screen. So I yeah. will put it over here. But basically here is where I was talking about your HV interval. Your HV interval is um, increased. And then here you have your hiss, but then there's no V, 
this is what your EKG typically looks like if you have infrahisian disease. Um, when you see um, that you have um, infrahisian block, most of the time your QRS is usually wider. Um, sometimes you see it a little, little bit like less than 120 milliseconds, but normally it's wider than that. It's usually um, you know, wider. And so when you see that, then you're a little bit more concerned. In this particular situation, um, you can see that your PR intervals don't change, right? You have a P and a dropped beat, and then your PR interval after the block and the PR interval before the block are basically the same. So that tells you, hey, this is a second degree AV block of type two. Um, and then I suspect that this will end up being infrahisian because your QRS is um, lower. So here again, we have an HV interval. Your HV interval is, you know, prolonged here. So that's number one. The second thing is where you have your blocked beat. You have your A, you have your H, you have no V. So therefore, that means that this is infrahisian. This is a second degree AV block type two that's infrahisian. And this is somebody who you'd want to put a pacemaker in. Um, and you should be concerned about that block. Now, when you have your two to one blocks, it becomes a little bit difficult for you to determine if it's, you know, first of all, you can't determine if it's a second degree type one or a type two. There's certain things that tell you that it is um, in the AV node, your block is in the AV node, um, certain things that tell you it's at the level of the Hiss. Um, when it's at the level of the Hiss, you're a little bit more concerned you want to put in a pacemaker. If it's not at the level of the Hiss, then it's basically, it might be physiologic and it might be something else that you need to um, take care of. Um, a lot of the time, like if you have a patient who has, um, for instance, um, severe COPD or sleep apnea, it's not unusual for you to see a two to one block there. Even if the heart rate is in the 30s, there was one patient that I had who had like a nine second pause um, but it was in the setting of sleep apnea, um, a pacemaker really wasn't um, indicated and actually what they should be getting is CPAP. Um, but that's why it becomes important to determine if this is, you know, in the AV node versus if it's um, infrahisian. And so um, when you see it, you should be concerned that there is some disease of the AV node, but sometimes, again, it could be physiologic. Um, if you have a prolonged um, HV interval, then you're more concerned. If you have a prolonged AH interval, which is most of the time what we see, um, then that means a lot of times it's physiologic. Sometimes you can have impaired function, but most of the time it's physiologic. And then if your PR interval is less than 160 milliseconds, when you do have AV nodal conduction, then it's something that um, you should be a little bit more concerned that it is um, intra or infrahisian. So a two to one block, this is an example of what you would see here. The PR interval is prolonged, your QRS is relatively narrow. Um, so you should be thinking that, oh, this is probably superhisian at this point. Um, if it's intrahisian, same thing happens where you have intermittent conduction, um, QRSs might be narrow. You might have um, fragmentation of the his signal. Um, and so in, um, when you have isoproteranol, you actually um, have a decrease in your um, QRS um, improving um, versus if it's in the AV node. If you give any um, agents that are going to increase conduction in the AV node, then that will actually improve conduction. So a patient who is exercising or you gave iso isoproteranol, you gave um, dopamine, you give atropine, that typically will improve conduction in the AV node, um, that will actually improve. And then that should tell you, hey, this is somebody who has superhisian disease, might not need a pacemaker. If any of that does not improve conduction or actually worsens conduction, then you should be a little bit concerned that, hey, this is a person that needs a pacemaker sooner rather than later. So in this case, this is two to one block, you see this fragmented hiss, which already should give you a hint that, hey, this person probably needs a pacer. Um, and then when you see the block, you actually see only one hiss, you don't see the second hiss. So this tells you that this is an atrioventricular block two to one that is intrahissian. Here it's suprahissian. So basically 
where you see your A and you see your dropped B, you don't see a hiss, you don't see a V. When you do see the hiss, um, the AH interval is prolonged, HV interval looks normal. When you see the A dropped beat, there's no hiss. So therefore this is suprahissian. So how do you determine if it is happening at the level of you know, the AV node or if it's happening below the level of the AV node? Look at your QRS width, if it's wide, Typically, it's happening, you know, down, um, further down. If it's normal, then it's typically happening in the AV node. Look at the PR interval of the conducted P wave. If it's greater than um, 200 milliseconds, then the block typically usually is in the AV node. If it's less than 200 milliseconds, then the block is usually in the his Purkinje system. Um, if atropine or exercise improve conduction, then that means that there's block in the AV node. So think about it like this. Anything that improves your sympathetic tone, improves conduction through the AV node, then that and that improves, you know, conduction, then that means that your original defect would have to be in the AV node. If it worsens conduction, then that means that your block is actually in the his Purkinje system. And so that is actually somebody who needs to be um, have a pacemaker. Alternatively, if you do something that is supposed to slow down conduction in the AV node and it actually improves conduction, then that means that there is block in the his Purkinje system. And that means actually that person needs a pacemaker. So you have somebody with two to one AV block, you do a carotid massage, which slows down conduction through the AV node. And it actually causes your EKG to get better. That means that that person actually has AV block that's worse, and that person needs to get a pacemaker. Okay. So you're basically saying by slowing down the AV node, you're allowing the his Purkinje system to kind of recover and conduct, exactly. which indicates that the problem is below the AV node versus anything exactly. that would stimulate the AV node and improve it indicates that's your issue. Perfect. Yes. So, and then of course, retrograde conduction. Um, if you have retrograde conduction, the block is typically in the his Purkinje system, but it could be anywhere. So um, this number five, we typically don't use. We typically use number four, easy, quick, and dirty. You see two to one AV block, tell the person to flap their legs. And if it gets better, then you basically say, okay, this is in the AV node. We need to figure out what's causing you to not have a heartbeat. Um, but if they do that and they're like, they faint, then just say, okay, yeah, we need to do something about this. And then there's sometimes it gets a little bit confusing, right? So you have a patient, you know, you put them on either isoproteranol or dopamine or anything that would increase the heart or atropine. And then you're like, well, the heart rate went from 40 beats a minute to 45. And then you're like, oh, this is nodal. Let's let it go. Actually, if the heart rate the ventricular rate went from 40 to 45, but the sinus rate went from 80 to 160, then that's an issue. So it becomes a little bit, you have to look at your EKG and have to see the degree to which the improvement happened. And that will tell you a little bit of what's going on. Okay. All right, keep it moving. High-grade AV block, that's basically for those patients who you see a lot of P waves and not that many QRSs, but they come in like intervals and you see more than two Q waves between QRSs, right? It could be one of two things. It could be either a complete heart block or it's a high-grade AV block. How do you differentiate between a high-grade AV block and a complete heart block? Typically, a high-grade AV block, you would have one-to-one -one conduction and then all of a sudden, you have P waves just running away and no QRSs. Those are the patients who will come in, typically their EKGs look normal, and then all of a sudden they just pass out. Um, I've the couple of times, and there are very few EP emergencies, this is one of them because this person will need a pacemaker ASAP. Now for third degree AV block, that basically tells you, hey, there's no connection between what's happening in the top chamber and the bottom chamber. Whether it's suprahissian, infrahissian, intrahissian, you still have to put in a pacemaker. However, the way you define it depends on the EP study. I'll show you some examples. Um, typically, because these patients usually come in with an escape rhythm, 
they typically don't have come in with syncope. They just come in that they're really tired and then they look at their EKG and the EKG shows you a V block. In this particular situation, you have your A's marching out, you have your V's marching out. Your A doesn't have a hiss attached to it, but everywhere you see the V, you have the hiss attached to it. What does this mean? This AV, um, this block is in the AV node. So it's super hissian, but it's still a third degree AV block. So this again, for treatment purposes, it doesn't really mean anything. For testing purposes, it could mean something. So this is just a way for you to define the different levels of block. So intrahissian block, same thing. Um, you basically have a situation where you have your fragmentation, but then where you see the A, you'll see a hiss. Wherever you see the V, you also see a hiss. So basically this tells you that your third degree AV block is at the level is within the hiss. Either way, again, you still will put in a pacemaker. Um, for infrahissian block, this also is defined by the EP study. Here, the hiss follows the A instead of following the V. And typically your escape rhythm is just going to be a ventricular escape rhythm. Your QRSs are typically wider. Again, you know, I think the only difference that it makes here is that whenever you see a wide QRS as your escape rhythm, then that QRS is typically less reliable than one that comes from the junction. So when you see an H that goes with the V, the um, pacemaker is coming from the junction and typically a junctional rhythm is a little bit more stable than a ventricular rhythm. And so when you have a junctional rhythm, you want to, you know, put in the pacemaker ASAP for, I'm sorry, if you have a junctional rhythm, then you have a little bit of time. Those are the patients who come in and, you know, their doctor will say, oh, they've had this heart rate for the last five years. And then you put in a pacemaker and that junction is like, finally, and it quits and it never works again, right? Um, for your um, wide complexes, those are the patients who will die suddenly. And so you want to get those patients in as quickly as possible because the escape rhythm is ventricular versus the escape rhythm being junction. Right. And you still have an intrahissian block with an escape that is lower in the conduct. Like, could the block still be mm -hmm. within the hiss, but then your escape is actually disassociated and below the hiss? Exactly. It, it would just show up as infrahissian because you don't see this, the preceding H. No, so anytime it comes from the hiss is going to be narrow. So whether it's intrahissian or suprahissian is going mm. to look narrow because it's coming from within the conduction system. Mm. But when you don't have a hiss, so when it's when it's infrahissian, then your mm. escape rhythm is going to be from the ventricle and that's going to be wide. Sorry, I, I just meant like, because you can have a disassociation between the side of the block and the side of the, side of the escape, which mm -hmm. kind of convolutes. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So Convolutes um, things a little bit. <laughs> um, so um, what about um, isorhythmic AV dissociation then? Is that like, is that? So isorhythmic AV dissociation is just more of a condition where we, you, we don't know what, where the block is, right? Because for you to define AV block, your sinus node has to be faster than your AV node or whatever is happening, your escape rhythm. If your escape rhythm is faster than your sinus node, then that's a junctional tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. And there really isn't a problem with the AV node. When you have isorhythmic AV dissociation, that means that the atrium is going the same as the ventricle. So we don't really know which is which. We don't know what's happening and why it's dissociated. It just describes a phenomenon. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. And so, you know, when we're talking about diagnosis and treatment, you know, we just kind of go back to the guidelines, right? The most recent guidelines were in 2018. Um, basically, what it says is that for you to diagnose, you know, um, sinus node dysfunction, um, if you have somebody who's symptomatic with syncope, um, where sinus node dysfunction is suspected, 
Um, and a lot of times sinus nerve dysfunction becomes very difficult to diagnose because you know you typically don't see it on the EKG unless they have it on the EKG presenting. Then an EP study um, is a class one indication actually. Now, um, if you just want to study, you know, what's happening with the anti-grade and retrograde conduction, um, or if the patient um, has syncope and you want to exclude any other mechanism, for instance, maybe they have like, you know, some substrate for VT, or, you know, you want to make sure they don't have any AV block, then it's reasonable um, for you to um, do a EP study but you don't want to do an EP study in patients where their symptoms are clearly related to sinus node dysfunction, right? So if there's a question, then yes, do an EP study. If it's already clear and you just want to like satisfy your curiosity, don't do it. Because with every um, procedure that we do, as you know, there's always risks, right? So for sinus node dysfunction, you know, when we're um, looking at the patients, you want to first of all see hey, is there a reversible or physiologic cause? You want to treat the underlying cause. You know, a lot of times you'd be worried about sleep apnea. Um, sometimes you can have some like hypothyroid, for instance, you know, that could cause you to have a sinus node dysfunction. Um, and then if the treatment is effective, then all you need to do is observe. Um, if it's not, then you want to make sure that they don't have, you know, some sort of structural heart disease. Um, one thing that you should make sure of if you see somebody with sinus node dysfunction, hey, do they have some infiltrative heart disease? Um, sometimes you can see that in patients who have, um, you know, sarcoidosis um, or, you know, amyloid, that could be um, also an issue, but less so. Um, if they have symptoms, though, you know, you want to make sure that you interrogate that a little bit more. And um, if they have problems with your EKG or exercise EKG, then you definitely want to go towards treatment. And when we talk about treatment, we're talking about either putting in a pacemaker directly or going through towards invasive diagnosis um, to see if they need to be treated. For your um, atrioventricular nodal dysfunction, um, if you have somebody where you are suspecting that they have a Hisperkinji block, and these days it's typically in the context of somebody who has had a TAVR, for instance, we see a prolonged QRS interval, but don't really know if we should be putting in a pacemaker or not, those patients, um, we typically will do an EP study possible, right? Um, the patients that you do not want to do anything for are the patients where you already know that they have AV block. So if you already see it, then don't do it. Um, if you have a patient who has, you know, AV block, but it's asymptomatic, then there really isn't anything for you to do. You basically, the EP study shouldn't change your management, right? Again, this is a schematic that's also in the guidelines, pretty much telling you, hey, if you see something, you know, first of all, you want to evaluate, is it symptomatic, is it not? Um, if it is, you might want to do an EP study, but um, if you see it apparently, then go ahead and treat it. And if you don't see it and you don't see anything with further testing, then please don't. So what is the treatment? Well, the treatment is a pacemaker. You know, yes, people talk about giving theophylin. It's not really the greatest medication for you to um, treat um, either sinus node dysfunction or AV block. And it's not always, um, you know, something that you can actually uh, predict. And so you do want to put in a pacemaker. When you're putting in pacemakers, we talk about, you know, the indications for placement of pacemaker. Class one indication, symptomatic bradycardia, symptomatic sinus pauses, symptomatic chronotropic incompetence. So there's sometimes somebody comes in, heart rate is 60. You put them on a treadmill, they only go to 80. And then all of a sudden they're like, I can't do it. I can't. And they jump off the treadmill. And usually it's very dramatic when you see somebody with chronotropic incompetence. First thing you should do when you see chronotropic incompetence, number one should be making sure they don't have any medications that could affect that. Um, I had a patient who was on a beta blocker for her heart failure and her heart rate could not go above 90. And so every time she would walk from here to there, couldn't do anything. Because she had heart failure and because she needed to be on a pacemaker, she ended up having a device placed. And she needed a device anyway because her EF was low. But um, she ended up having a device placed sooner rather than later because she needed to be on the beta blocker. And she can't live her life not being able to do things because, you know, um, we're there, right? 
So the other thing um, would be um, symptomatic um, sinus node um, bradycardia that um, results from drug therapy for a medical condition. So for instance, that lady that I talked to you about with heart failure, or if we're talking about, um, you know, that um, somebody who has atrial fibrillation, you know, that could be um, a cause as well. Um, a class 2A indication. So that basically means, hey, you should do it. If you have sinus node dysfunction with a heart rate less than 40, with a history of symptoms, definitely put a pacemaker in. If you have syncope of unknown origin, and then you find abnormalities of sinus node dysfunction, um, of sinus node function on an EP study, um, you want to put an, a pacemaker in. Um, and then, of course, um, consider it in patients who have a heart rate of less than 40, even if they have minimal symptoms. What you don't want to put in a pacemaker is an asymptomatic patient. We see that all the time. Patients will come in, heart rate in the low 40s, but they're asymptomatic. You put them on a treadmill, they're able to walk. Please don't put in a pacemaker because you have introduced something to their lives that they don't necessarily need. Um, if you have documented symptoms that were not that were not there when the patient had bradycardia then you shouldn't put in a pacemaker because the pacemaker is not going to improve their symptoms, okay? And then also, um, if you have symptomatic bradycardia in the presence of non-essential medical therapy, then the treatment should be take away that therapy and you know their bradycardia should get better. So they shouldn't have a pacemaker placed at that point. For AV nodal dysfunction, you know, if you have third degree or second degree with symptoms or ventricular arrhythmias, if you have asymptomatic third degree or second degree with pauses that are greater than three seconds, asymptomatic third degree or second degree with AFib and pauses that are greater than five seconds, um, all of these things should necessitate class one indication for placement of a pacemaker. So, and usually what you'll find is that for guidelines, class ones are usually with symptoms. So either you have sinus node dysfunction, AV nodal dysfunction with symptoms. They also make mention of some neuromuscular diseases, infiltrative diseases, you know, um, that would be is an issue. And then this one here where you have asymptomatic um, third degree AV block with heart rate less than 40, but you have LV dysfunction. You should definitely put in a pacemaker for that. For your um, class twos, if you have, you know, Basically, if you have third degree AV block, then you should put it in. Um, if you have a narrow QRS, second degree type two, any evidence of infrahissian disease, definitely put it in. Um, if they're asymptomatic, but with intra or infrahissian disease on an EP study, you definitely want to put that in. A 2B um, would be um, all of this, plus if they have drug use or toxicity, even if the effect is expected, even after the drug is withdrawn. Um, that's very rare that that happens, but when it does, you do want to put a pacemaker in um, afterwards. Um, and then for um, your class three, if it's asymptomatic and the patient has maybe AV block, but basically it's suprahissian or is first degree, or in cases where you're expected to resolve and not return, um, don't put in a pacemaker. And the reason why, you know, these guidelines are really important is because whenever you put in a device, you have a patient who's going to have a device in them that they're going to have for the rest of their lives, right? So somebody is going to be depending on you initially putting in that device for you to have known what you were putting it in for and for it to be an indication, an accepted indication, you know, and they're going to change the generator regardless, right? Um, you want to make this as easy as possible for the person moving forward so that they don't have to, there's no question about, oh, was it indicated? You know, oh, I don't know. You know, because most people, once you have a device, they're not going to take out the device without a very good reason. So that's number one. Placement of a pacemaker does have increased risks during the procedure but more importantly, also has increased risk after the procedure, right? The risk of infection, the risk of, you know, fracture to the device, the risk of valvular abnormalities, that does happen with placement of the device. 
And so you only want to put the device in in patients where it's absolutely necessary. So back really to quick. our questions. So you had mentioned, um, for example, uh, Lyme disease and things like that. What, what's your thoughts on temporary pacing as a bridge? So temporary pacing, um, it really depends. Like, so in the two cases of Lyme disease that I've seen, um, when you started treating them with doxycycline, it basically came back in a couple of days. So temporary pacing is good for that. Um, most of the time, if you expect it to, like the, the most temporary pacing or reversible, questionable reversible, um, you know, AV block that I've seen is mostly in the cases of surgery where, you know, after AV nodals, um, AV aortic valve surgery, you notice that they have like a transient block that goes away. Um, usually we'll wait probably till post-op day number five, and then we'll make a decision. So if after post-op day number five, the patient, the heart function has not, or the heart rate hasn't come back, then it is what it is. You put in your pacemaker. Even though, let's say, okay, after, I don't know, 30 days, the patient doesn't need the pacemaker anymore. That's not to say that the patient won't need it later. And so nobody will say, oh, we've put it in, but we're going to take it out after that, if that's your question. Yeah, no, exactly. That are are using like an IJ as a bridge or something like that. But. Typically, we do that in patients who, you know, we have a reasonable expectation of them being able to, for us making that decision within that hospital stay. So, and what I mean is like less than five days. If we're thinking more than five days, then we're putting in a permanent because even if it comes back at day number six, you know, do I trust it, Right. Because nobody wants somebody to go home and then, you know, you finish this heart surgery and then they die of a V block. That would be a bummer. So Perfect. back to our questions. I was 75 year old man, history of hypertension, no symptoms, irregular rhythm on exam, EKG shown in figure one and noted his heart rate increases appropriately with exercise. So First things first, what do we think that this rhythm is? And either you can write it in the chat or... Second degree type one. Yes, so this is the second degree type one, right? So what would the next best step in image managing this patient, what would it be? Sorry, I have to make moves. Otherwise, <laughs> my no, light it's... might turn off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think if I remember reading the description earlier, it was asymptomatic, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I think that, you know, symptoms always take, you know, precedence over a lot of this. So type one, asymptomatic, probably continue to observe. Maybe. Exactly. Loop recorder. So, and the that's why me, the iPhone. The old rep me. <laughs> The old ref move continues to observe. Says loop recorder. Exactly. You know, just... <laughs> Continued observation. Exacto mundo. So basically, you know, what this shows is, uh, you know, second degree type one. Um, patient is asymptomatic. And, you know, the patient had a heart rate that increased appropriately with exercise. Most of your symptoms were during rest. So just increased vagal tone. So you just kind of observe the patient and see what happens. Excellent. So next patient, we have an asymptomatic 72-year-old man. And he was found to be bradycardic. Sinus, um, EKG showed sinus rhythm with two to one AV block. Now they said, which of the following would be consistent with infranodal AV block? Wow. would be E. We have some exactly. uh, Dr. Oldemeji says E as well. Exactly. So basically we mentioned of that, that anything that slows down AV conduction, 
but improves, um, you know, if it improves your AV conduction, it's supposed to slow down AV conduction and actually improves it in this instance, then that tells you that this is infranodal and this patient, even though they're asymptomatic, they should be getting a pacer. Everything else is actually a sign of supranodal disease. So in summary, um, basically, if you look at your, we talked about this, you know, when we're talking about differences when you see two to one AV block. Here, if you see, you know, for carotid sinus massage, if you have an improvement in your um, um, his bundle um, conduction, then that tells you that that's infrahisian. And so that tells you that, you know, the patient actually has a worse um, AV block than not. And then for um, question number three, we have a 76-year-old woman, history of two prior ablation procedures, has atrial fibrillation, um, on Sotolol, um, actually had sinus bradycardia with a ventricular rate of 40 beats a minute. And now she noted increased fatigue and sinus rhythm. What's your next best step in management? What do you think? And you could argue probably a given that with Sotolol she's uh, in sinus rhythm, so I'd probably option A at the moment. Exactly, I agree. So pretty much, you know, in this particular case, we have somebody who has AFib with very fast heart rates, needs the medication. You know, yes, could you switch to am amiodarone? Sure, but nobody really likes amio, right? Um, Secondly, you know, would you do um, propafenone? It actually works worse than um, Sotolol. And so Sotolol would be the better, it seemed to work really well, but instead, you know, you had really bad bradycardia. So a dual chamber pacemaker in this particular patient would satisfy that class one indication for somebody who needed um, very necessary treatment for the arrhythmia, but, um, you know, would also, um, had a symptomatic bradycardia with the medication. And so you would do um, a dual chamber pacer in this. So in summary, you know, patient with first degree V block or sinoatrial block, you know, if they're intrahis or infrahis, would you put in a pacemaker? Yes, with symptoms. Questionable without symptoms, you know, but it really depends. And then AV nodal, definitely not. The second degree, where you have intermittent conduction, remember the groups everywhere. Intrahis or infrahis, yes. AV nodal, only with symptoms really. And then third degree, basically the same thing. But most of the time we end up putting in a pacemaker in just because depending on whether, first of all, number one, patients sometimes don't know when they have symptoms or not. And secondly, also depending on what the escape rhythm is. So if it's intrahis or infrahis, we definitely want to put one in. Um, if it's AV nodal, we'll see. But most of the time, we end up putting one in. Okay. And that's it. Any questions? Monitoring the chat for any questions. I know we had one from uh, Dr. Oladameji was wondering about the P2P uh, Interval speeding up during sinoatrial. You talked about oh the that. P2P yes. Can, so, can we bring that slide up to revisualize it because I think it helped to have. Let's see. That's... Yeah. So. Well, you bring that up. Fantastic talk. I really, you know, I learned a lot on this one. So I hope everyone else gained a lot of value as well because that was that was great. Let's see. Sweet. I'm sure there's an easier way of doing this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a nice retrograde review. All right. There we go. Here. So basically, when you're um, looking at it, just think about it like this, right? It's the same. The reason, the reason for your P to P getting shorter is the same reason that your R to R gets shorter with second degree type one. If you block. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have your P, 
if you have your PR interval, right, increasing, but your P wave is coming when it's supposed to all the time, it's just your PR interval that's increasing. Your RR interval gets shorter because your PP interval stays the same. So when that happens, your like, so we're talking about second degree type um, one for AV nodal conduction, right? And actually, let me let me see whether I can kind of pull that up. All right. So see here, right? Your PR interval goes from your PP interval stays the same, right? Your PR interval gets longer and longer, but your PP interval stays the same. So your RR interval gets shorter. So everybody sees that? So it's a similar situation here with your, um, it's a similar situation with the um, sinoatrial block here. So I'll go here, where you have your P, P interval. So if you think about your sinus node, right, coming in on top of this, right? So basically the P wave is basically a sign that, hey, the sinus node, the sinus node impulse has gone through the transitional cells and gone to the rest of the atrium, right? But let's say here, the sinus node impulse is here. Here, the sinus node impulse is there because there's a little bit of a delay. It comes to this P wave. Here, the sinus node impulse. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Do you see it now? Yep. Okay. So let's say here, sinus node impulse is here, right? And then it gets to this P wave. Here, sinus node impulse is a little bit over there, but it goes over here, right? Here, your sinus node impulse is back here, and then it gets even longer over there. Let's look at the ladder diagram, right? Sinus node impulse, sinus node impulse, sinus node impulse, all of these are equal, right? However, the delay gets longer, right? So your PP interval, the interval between this and this and that, actually get shorter because the interval between this, which is your sinus nodal impulse and your atrial conduction is actually getting longer. And is the combination of two things. Your sinus node impulse is your PP or your sinus node, your sinus nodal impulses are coming at the same rate, right? But your transition to the atrium is getting longer. So therefore, the PP, the P interval, which is basically the um, manifestation of what's happening in the atrium, actually gets shorter. So marinate on it. Think about it a little. <laughs> Watch this video again, and yeah. I promise you it will make sense. Or you can just basically cram it and say, hey, if we see shorter PP intervals and we see a dropped one, the sinoatrial block. Perfect. Uh, Tosin, you say it long think... enough, you'll begin to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Tosin looks like you had a question. Uh, you can either put it in the chat or, or say it out loud if you'd like. Hello. Um, Dr. Jama, thank you very much for this wonderful um, presentation. So uh, my question exactly is, if we have a patient, for example, we not dependent on them um, pacemaker before implants, let's say type 2, um, um, second degree type 2 AV block, and then we this patient got a pacemaker. And years, over the years, they became dependent on the, this pacemaker What's the mechanism behind dependency in this patient? Like the electrophysiology mechanism, what have what has happened to their conduction system? I just wanted to understand. I mean, so the older you get, I, I think uh, Dr. Patazic showed a um really good um 
slide where you talked about fibrosis with time. And so a lot of times you have increasing fibrosis with age and that just happens with, I mean, normally it's there in patients who need pacemakers, you know, it's there. So it was just that increasing fibrosis typically will end up causing you to have increasing dependence. Does that satisfy the question? Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. So I, I have been told in the past that there is, you know, a mechanism where the tissue just kind of gets lazy uh, because of, you know, concurrent pacing. Have, is that, have you seen or observed anything like that? Or do you think it's just progressive? Well, it definitely happens with, it definitely happens with complete heart block where you have a underlying pacemaker right? So the sinus node is not working. And so is the junction that's taking over or the AV node is not working and either the junction or the ventricle is taking over. Basically, once you come in with your extra beat rather, then whatever the escape rhythm is, is like, okay, great. I don't have to work anymore. And it basically checks out. Um, if it's in the junction, typically, you know, at least in a pinch, it will come back in. Um, but most of the time, it, it's there's a long pause before it comes in. For the um, for the ventricle, typically that doesn't come back. And so those are the ones that we want to put in the pacemaker sooner rather than later. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Pause for dramatic effect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I, I know you have a busy day ahead of you still. So yes. um, thank you very much for, for this talk. I, it was very um, engaging and I, I really am going to watch this a couple more times before I understand that, that sinoatrial stuff. We'll get to the bottom of it. Uh, for everyone else for jumping on, uh, I apologize for bumping up the timing. We just had some uh, something we really couldn't control for. So we wanted to make sure that we stay with our current curriculum and we'll continue through on to next week. So if you didn't catch the first half of it, I will get this posted on YouTube in the next um, 12 hours or so. It should be available for everyone. It just takes a while to upload. And then uh, we'll go from there. Any questions, you know, feel free to continue to reach out to us and we're happy to answer whatever you may have. And Thank you very much, Dr. Caro, for your time. And this was, uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Caro. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. No problem. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 B